this. This is what everybody wants to do. They want to get their name on this trophy and they'll get their chance on Sunday. So here's a look at the final eight teams still standing in the NCAA tournament. The Vols and Purdue met back in November in the semifinals of the Maui Invitational with the Boilermakers getting the 71 to 67 win. There are three teams still alive from the ACC, two from the SEC, Tennessee there, and then two from the Big Ten in Purdue and Illinois, and then that final team there, UConn, from the Big East. One word answer as to what makes this place so special, tradition. This, the Streamline Hotel, is literally the place where NASCAR was born, and Daytona is the place everyone wants to win. The most glaring statistic is this one right here. No wins against a Division I program with a winning record. Casey, I am joined now by the new head football coach of the ETSU Bucks, Trey Lamb. First of all, Trey, congratulations. And what are your first impressions of ETSU? What we do, hardest playing, best condition, most connected, toughest team. It's been good enough so far to get us here. It'll be good enough to get us on top of the ladder. Here we go. Just compete. Just compete. Together on three. One, two, three. Here we go. That was ETSU head coach Brooke Savage firing up the Bucks in the pregame. ETSU playing in their first Southern Conference championship game since 2020 and trying to become the first school since 1939 to win four games in four days. The winner of this game would move on to the Southern Conference championship game. The Bucks looking to knock off number one seeded Samford. Early on, the Bulldogs came barking. Jermaine Marshall off to a core, a core for the bucket and one. Samford would jump out to an 11 to two lead, but here come the Bucks. Kamari Peterson attacking the glass and finishing for the tough two now all tied up it's peterson again between the legs step back and his triple goes down the bucks take their first lead of the game later on the bucks down two again alan struthers drives and kicks out to tyler rice delivering off the bench to give the bucks a lead back etsu trail by just two at the half second half sanford on the mood as Jaden campbell takes the pass and hits from beyond the arc that puts the bucks down nine but here comes etsu again bucks swinging around the arc and ebby asamoa delivers from downtown Cuts the deficit to five. Then it's Peterson with a lay-in. He has 17. Asamoa had 18 for the Bucks. Final minutes, Rylan Jones gets the pass, batted down, but finds it mid-air and finishes, and that's just kind of how the final stretch would go. ETSU's magical run ends, falling 76-69 to 69 in the title game. Look at this incredible crash. We all know racing is dangerous, and those who do it are obviously adrenaline junkies, but NASCAR is a billion-dollar industry show. Should top stars be allowed to participate in extracurricular activities, like other forms of racing that could put them out of the car for weeks. For a large chunk of its 75 years, the sport of NASCAR was as black and white as the photos that detail its history. Not that there weren't diverse fans or even drivers trying to make it in the sport, but at times it seemed as if the sport did not want them to be a part of it. In the early 2000s, Tennessee icon Reggie White started a diversity program with Cup Series owner Joe Gibbs. And shortly after, NASCAR founded its own diversity program. The first Drive for Diversity Combine was held in 2004 as a way to test the top talent of all backgrounds and help to find a place in the sport. It helped develop current Cup stars like Bubba Wallace, Kyle Larson, and Daniel Suarez. This year marks the 20th Advanced Auto Parts Drive for Diversity Combine. I got an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at how it works and how it creates stars of the sport. The Central Girls soccer team knew this could be a good season. They just never really understood how good it could be. Yesterday, honestly, at the end of the game, our coaches asked us to raise our hands if we thought that we'd get that far. And not even half of our team raised their hands because we didn't think that we had it. And then it just clicked. That's when everything changed. Like, we made it past first round of regions, and then we, we didn't want to lose the second round. So we wanted to keep going, and we still want to keep going, and we want to make it to the championship. Their success? built on the concept of family. The key is, is passion and hard work. Um, we, we don't have any superstars that just take over the game, but we have a group of girls who care for one another and they work extremely hard. An idea that's more than just a chant and was put to the test earlier this season. We've learned that a juvenile killed in an ATV crash Sunday evening in Wise County was a middle school student. That student was Nate Jordan. 
younger brother of sophomore Abby Jordan. My team and my coach was very respectful of it's okay if I didn't want to come back or if I wanted just to come practice, if I just wanted to come to games, they were open to anything. Abby took some time and we didn't know if she would feel like playing again, but we were here with open arms just to show love and support and, and togetherness if she wanted to come back. Abby found out that stepping out onto the soccer field would also be the first step towards healing. My parents, they sat down and talked to me and asking, you know, do you want to go back? And at first I did it for them just so they had something to do, but in the long run I realized it helped me out a lot, getting out of the house, talking with friends. Wearing my cleats with the P for N on it, I do have the play for Nate on my stuff and everybody normally writes it on their things. It is a motivator for Abby. To do this in honor of Abby and Nate, uh, it means the world to us to be able to go and play and, you know, do our best. So now, whenever she or her teammates need strength, all they have to do is look past the bleachers. Sometimes up here there's so many sunsets and like every night there's a sunset, pretty much. And I can just know when there is one, he's there watching and I can just feel it and it feels nice. Few athletes are instantly recognized by one name, even fewer by one article of clothing. But then again, few are at the level of Richard Petty. There's athletes in certain sports that do transit, um, but you take them out of that context and people recognize them still, and that's the way he is. He changed the sport, not only in the generation when he was most successful, but um, every generation after. Nicknamed the king by the media in the mid-60s. Rather be called that and a lot of other things. Petty and his family have been a part of the sport since its inception, with his father running the first NASCAR race 75 years ago. I went to the very first race, at, uh, cup race that NASCAR had in 1949. The Petty family accomplishments since then read like a guide to the biggest races and the biggest moments in the sport. Some of his records are, are, that he has made, um, they're never going to be touched because of the amount of races we run, because of where we're at in the sport. But for the king and his petty court, the legacy is about so much more than what Richard has done on the track. I did nothing by myself. There was always my dad or my brother, Dale Inman, our crew chief. I had the family around you, uh, but then you had all these people that worked for us over the years. They're the ones that made it work. It's, it says 75 years uh, of racing, you know what I mean? But I think when you look back, it's also 75 years of family. Petty says the biggest legacy his family will leave behind is the Victory Junction Gang Camp. That's a camp for children with various illnesses. It was created in honor of Kyle's son, Adam, who was killed in a crash in New Hampshire in 2000. At the Daytona International Speedway, I'm Heather Williams.